Hello, welcome back to TMAG for our next uh, mystery tour. I'm Veronica and today I'm joined by Kovas Van Breeder, who is our Senior Conservator of Paper. Welcome. Thank you. Um, today we are meeting on the TMAG city site, which is on the country of the Muanina people, who did not survive British colonisation. And I'd like to acknowledge the Tasmanian Aboriginal community as the continuing custodians of Latruita, Tasmania, and I value their history, culture and strength. So today, Cobus is going to take us through a new exhibition we have on here at TMAG in our Salon Gallery, uh, which is called The Miseries of War. So let's head through. So can you tell us sure. um, a bit about an overview of this exhibition? Sure. This exhibition contains two 18-piece series by two artists um, separated by 301 years. Uh, Jacques Callot um, was an etcher, born in 1592 in Lorraine, the northern part of France, and Georges Gross um, was a, an artist in many mediums, was born in 1893 in Germany. Both of them um, witnessed and lived through periods of great conflict, and both these works are testament to human resilience as well as the uh, brutality of war. Both these artists also found it very important, one using etching and one lithography, to try to get their images to as many people as possible. Uh, this is a sort of a medium that lends itself to, to mass production without a, a loss of quality. Yes, so two different um, printmaking processes. Uh, just before we do head through, um, just so you are aware, there are some confronting images that we are in this exhibition. So keep that in mind as we head through. So perhaps a little something about um, Jacques Callot. Um, it's difficult to know everything about a person who lived 300 years ago, but we do know that he was, um, his father was a, a, no, a minor nobleman in the Duchy of Lorraine. Lorraine was not part of France, but was in what we now call France. At about 15 or 16, uh, Jacques decided to go to Rome to learn probably goldsmithing, but he ended up being fascinated by etching. He then moved to Florence in the early 1600s, where he studied under a Florentine etcher called Antonio Tempesta. Um, he, it is quite unusual for a, a son of a minor nobleman to take up etching. Etching wasn't considered one of the more um, finer arts. It was certainly used, but more for reproduction of paintings than, than actually making works on their own. Callot ended up um, in 1614 becoming part of the court of Cosimo de Medici II, a very famous and, and um, elegant court. Um, he worked for Cosimo for some 10, 15 years mainly illustrating the major court events um, of the court. As an indicator, the portrait you see here uh, today is, is, was drawn by Anthony Van Dyck. It's part of a series called the Iconography. Van Dyck um, completed some 200 portraits of, of prominent people of his day, including artists. And he probably drew this from life um, of Jacques Callot. It is, however, an engraving. And there's a distinction between engraving and etching. Engraving was considered a highest of art form at the time. Engraving is done by cutting into a copper plate, so you get many more impressions from the engraved copper plate. Etching is done by covering copper with a ground resist, and then by drawing lightly on the ground, which takes it off, putting it into the acid, which etches, etches a very spontaneous image. And this is probably why Callot loved it. The portrait you see of Callot here, drawn by Van Dyck, was actually engraved by one of Van Dyck's friends, uh, Lucas Wusterman. Wusterman was a fantastic engraver. He did a lot of engraving for Peter Paul Rubens. Van Dyck included a portrait of Wusterman's in his iconography, and you can see it here. This has not only been drawn by Van Dyck, it's actually been etched by Van Dyck, and it shows the great spontaneity of etching compared to engraving. It's a much freer and, and looser um, form of reproduction. Beautiful. So these ones by Callot are uh, etchings? Correct, yeah. correct. 
So Calo moved back on the death of Cosimo de Medici II, Calo moved back in the, uh, the 1620s to the Duchy of Lorraine, where he went into the service of the Duke, but also of, of anyone. Um, he was engaged by the, um, the Habsburgs, the Spanish Habsburgs, to do large scale work. Because of course, the good thing with etching is, when you, and, and engraving, you make lots of impressions, it can be used for propaganda. And a lot of things, a lot of celebratory or um, very large etchings were made, particularly by the Spanish court of their war in the Netherlands, and um, the the, queen, uh, the the royal the royalty of Spain engaged um, Calo to do a lot of those things. When he was at the court of the Medici's, he is credited with doing two, three really important things to make etching a much more um, important art form. One of the people at the court of the Medici's was Galileo Galilei, so it's thought that Calo um, managed to use and became familiar with lenses, because lenses made it possible to do very detailed work. He is also credited with developing a very good etching ground. That's the ground you put on the copper plate to stop the acid from biting in places you don't want it to bite. And it's thought he probably developed this ground for his contact with um, Florentine musicians who would have used varnishes and things on their instruments. One of the things Callo is very famous for is that he'd use this ground not only to make sure there was no foul biting or pitting, uh, ugly pitting, but it gave you great clarity and detail. So every line is very exact. There's no foul biting, there's no spreading out of, of, of the acid when it bites. You get really sharp lines. He also stopped out his etching plates. So when he was biting it with acid, he'd, he'd put a resist on the background, which would stop the acid from biting deeply, then stops the ink when you, run, when you ink up the plate and run it through the press from giving you a very dark line. So by doing this, you could get dark lines in the foreground by etching deeper, not, not stopping out, but by stopping out in the background, having lightly etched lines, which then gives you this great um, depth. spatial yeah. depth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. So he also developed a, an instrument called a shop, which is like a cylinder, cut diagonally at the end, so you have an oval at the end, and the shop was used to, to draw on, on these etching grounds very, very lightly meant when you spun it, sometimes you got a thick line, sometimes you got a thin line. And that also in some ways replicated some of the um, effects that uh, a Buren does for an engraver. So it made etching a much more palatable option uh, mm. for people. So it's sort of like a calligraphy pen, so you've got yes. a thin line and then you turn it and you've got yeah. the thickness as well. So this series, you know, Kello, um, he finished a series called The, the Large, or, or the, the Great, Miseries and disasters of, of and miseries and misfortunes of war. Unlike his other work, which was commissioned, Kello did something like fourteen hundred different etchings during his lifetime. This was not commissioned. This is probably done for himself. And it was done in eighteen thirty-three, and Kello died in eighteen thirty-five. Um, so just before his death, this this whole event of the miseries of war sort of encompasses something known as the Thirty Years' War, a tragic um, pan-continental event in Europe. Although Callo um, lived in the Duchy of Lorraine, which was semi-independent from France, Lorraine was not left out of this awful war. Basically, very simply, uh, the war began because the Austro, or the, the Habsburgs, who were the, the royal family of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, tried to force Catholicism on some of their Protestant um, um, peoples. And those Protestant states within the Habsburg Empire rebelled. And their rebellion drew in um, Protestant countries to the north, the Scandinavian countries. So because Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire were Habsburgs, and because Spain was also a Habsburg uh, monarchy, both those great countries went to war against their own citizens who were Protestant and against the Protestant countries in the north. Now France wanted to check this imbalance. They th this was a time of um, Cardinal Richelieu and of Louis XIII. And if any of you are familiar with the great novel, novels by um, Alexander Dumas in the 1840s of the Three Musketeers, this is this period. Cardinal Richelieu, although he was a Catholic and although France was Catholic, was a great um, um, politician 
and he practiced real politique, that is, pragmatic politics. So France aligned itself with the Protestants against the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Spanish and the Austrians. And this resulted in a, in a huge conflict because it drew everybody in. So it was literally a 30 years war with great mercenary armies. And you see here a mercenary army and the damage it does to, to any place it goes to because mercenary armies aren't often paid. And Cobus, um, what is the relationship between this um, series and the series of George Croesus? Right, so there's probably one work here we should focus on. It's probably the most famous um, etching in the whole series. It's called The Hanging. And you can see um, uh, soldiers, and, and this is what Callow did. Um, there are good soldiers, there are bad soldiers, there are good peasants, there are bad peasants. He doesn't take sides. He doesn't even identify who the soldiers are, what side they're on. These soldiers have been punished for, for a crime, and they're all hanging on the tree. The text beneath um, is by a good friend of Callot's called the Abbey Michel de Melo, and it uses the phrase like sad fruit hanging on a tree. Mm. And this image quite possibly, well, it has been very influential in lots of ways, and it certainly influenced the next series, which we're going to talk about, by uh, Georges Gross. So before we start with this, I have to um, um, thank the um, estate of George Gross for generously allowing us to exhibit these works. So George Gross um, was born in, 19, in 1893 in Germany. Um, his father died when he was young and his mother um, then, they, they lived in Berlin, ran a small inn or restaurant in Berlin. They moved to a garrison town called Stolp, which, is, um, which was the garrison town for the Blue Hussars. And Gross's mother um, ran the officer's canteen for the Blue so, so Gross grew up with a lot of German military men around him with all their affectations and strong military discipline. He was drawn to art very early, um, studied in, in, in Berlin, and um, before the war broke out, um, was already making a name for himself. When the war did break out, the First World War, he um, enlisted, tried to do his, his duty for, for his country, Within a couple of years, he, he had to be discharged due to illness. He had meningitis. And by this time, he hated the war. He hated the way um, Germany had, had allowed itself to be put into war. He hated the harsh discipline of the German military. He actually anglicised his name to the, the English spelling of George Gross, which you can see here instead of George Gross in German. The war was still happening, so this didn't make him very many friends. Um, but he was so incensed by it that um, he and other young Germans um, always remained very much then on the left of policy. He, he would have been sent back to the army, and, or he would have been actually sent to prison, but he had a great nervous breakdown, which almost, you know, if he would have been, he could have been jailed, he could have been executed. He just could not go back to, to fighting. Mm. Some influential friends helped him, and he ended up spending some time in a mental institution. So we'll go fast forward to 1928, 10 years after the end of the, second, of the First World War. Gross, like many ex-soldiers of his time, um, really um, related to a novel by a Czech artist called Yaroslav Hasek. The novel is called The Good Soldier Schweck, and it's a story of an Austro-Hungarian peasant who suffered many of the things that Gross and a lot of other soldiers suffered, particularly the stupidity of the, of the German military of the time, including people who were shell-shocked being put into mental um, institutions and basically tortured so they go back to the front. The Gross experienced that, and so did Schweck, in fact, in this fictional character. So this 18-piece series, which is similar to Gross's 18-piece, mm. um, is based on the story of Hasek's novel. It was handed out um, in 1928 to those who attended a play. Um, Gross did some of the, the theatre sets for this play. And here you see a direct um, reference to Callow's The Hanging Tree. In this case, um, Gross has used the German symbol, which denotes the end of a paragraph in a legal document. In other words, the law is actually hanging, um, hanging these, these poor soldiers. Yeah. Gross was um, a communist to start with after the war. In 1921, though, he went to Russia and decided he didn't like what was happening with communism. So, he turned instead to America 
He became a great um, lover of the American Wild West and the independence of America. He took to wearing a cowboy um, outfit on occasions. Um, American novels about the Wild West were very popular. Um, and he was a great fan of novels by an artist called, uh, an author called Carl May about the Wild West, about cowboys and Indians. Some of these, three of these images were considered blasphemous. And perhaps one in particular we should um, focus on. A lot of these series are directly from the, the book of the Good Soldier's Effect, but this one is of Gross's own, own imagination. The German translated reads as, shut up and soldier on. Mm. This caused, a, uh, um, for, um, Gross was brought to court for blasphemy for, for this image and two others in this series. That case stretched for, on for three years. Eventually, Gross was, um, um, was not found guilty. Interestingly, though, the, the German Quakers came to his defence, and a very brave Quaker by the name of Hans Albrecht in 1930 wrote a defence for George Gross, and I quote, he said, there is not a trace of blasphemy in it. It is rather much more the opposite that calls out a terrible accusation made by God against the blasphemous actions of man. So these were handed out. Um, some were confiscated. 1928, um, the case dragged on until the 1930s. Gross was literally acquitted just before the Nazis came to power. Two weeks before the Nazis came to power in Germany, Gross took his young family out of the country to New York. Um, two weeks later, German stormtroopers broke through his studio door with axes and would have killed him. The Nazis revoked his German citizenship, burnt a lot of his work, and removed and destroyed a lot of his work in national collections in Germany. Gross fortunately survived the war, returned to Berlin in 1939, where he died. And so you've got on display here, you're talking about um, the Good Soldier's Spec, the, the book. Yeah, that was, um... it's still available today if people wish to read it. Oh, right. This, this, this was a very interesting book. It's considered to have been one of the inspirations for uh, Joseph Heller's Catch-22. Mm -hmm. And um, down here, the, uh, this is what it would have looked like, the, the little castle that yes. people would have been handed out. Yes, Gross handed them out to people who attended the, the performance, yeah. the 18 we've just seen in this portfolio. And over here is a portrait, a self-portrait of George Gross on a, a very interesting um, publication he did in 1923 called Echi Homo, Behold the Man. It's uh, full of 100, uh, 100 lithographs, 16 coloured, of some of the scenes he witnessed in Weimar, Germany um, during the interwar period. The portrait of himself is a very honest, brutally honest portrait of Gross. Mm. He essentially says, um, I was each one of the very characters drawn, the champagne swilling glutton favoured by fate and the poor beggar um, on the street looking for food. So both these artists experience great um, hardship and, and sore brutality um, in their lives and often um, it, it's those, those things, unfortunately, that, that, that make um, substantial forms of art, artworks. I forgot mm. to mention that, that both Rembrandt van Rijn and um, uh, Francisco de Goya both collected Callot's work. And the obvious um, comparison is um, Francisco de Goya's Disasters of War, which Goya also did for himself, it wasn't commissioned, and which wasn't published until he died, um, is probably bears some resemblance to Callow's um, Miseries of War, which we know that, that Goya had a copy of. Mm. Wow, it's a lot to consider in here. Um, thank you so much thank for taking you. us through. And um, if you uh, have enjoyed this tour and you'd like to come see it for yourself, we are upstairs um, when you head into the Central Gallery in the Salon Gallery. Um, also, if you've enjoyed this tour, I've also done previously a mystery tour with Cobus in his uh, studio at Rosny and we looked at, in his painting conservator studio, and we looked at a work that is actually on, on display downstairs in our Thomas Griffiths Lane Wright Paradise Lost exhibition, which is on until the 2nd of October as well. And ha when is this exhibition um, open until? Uh, it's open until the 7th of November. Great. Just before Armistice Day. Yeah. Thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.